Um, now, joining and welcoming today's seminar speaker, Dr. Paul Regular, is here with us from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, where he's a research scientist studying the population ecology of northern cod. Dr. Regular is from the west coast of Newfoundland and completed his PhD at Memorial University, where he studied seabird foraging ecology. His research interests include population dynamics, quantitative ecology, and predator prey dynamics. He's here to share with us his insight into fish stock assessment from an ecologist's perspective. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Regular. Thank you for the intro and uh, apologies to everyone. I, I wish that I could be there in person uh, with you all, but uh, as has been happening over the past couple of years, uh, COVID got in the way. And, uh, and so you'll have to excuse maybe any background noise that's coming from my son who's isolating and watching YouTube. Um, so, uh, so keep that in mind. <laughs> and, uh, um, and also, I apologize for uh, maybe if an earlier title uh, misled you to come here and then I'd solve a lot of the world stock assessment problems. Uh, but as I started hauling things together, I realized maybe that was a little ambitious and uh, and the talk was all about uh, reducing my uncertainty and confusion with regards to a stock assessment. And so jumping into things, if my slides will advance. Aha. Um, Coming to Fisheries and Oceans Canada from a seabird background, uh, it was uh, quite the, the learning curve. And uh, right off the bat, I have no qualms with saying that the stock assessment is hard. Um, the, the underlying questions behind stock assessment sound fairly straightforward. Uh, and that is like, how many fish are in the sea and how many can we sustainably harvest? Um, the, the, they sound deceivingly simple, but, uh, but they are a lot easier to ask than answer. Um, and so I spend most days just feeling like this guy, uh, just in a state of confusion. Um, but uh, uh, really, ultimately, it, what is it at the core? Uh, it's a scientific process that's marked by three core steps that's, that's very familiar to just about any other scientific process. Uh, step one is we have to go out and collect data. And there are huge monitoring programs that are ongoing and by Fisheries and Oceans Canada and other places to obtain biological data and fisheries data from various monitoring programs. Um, and then once we have those data, uh, we apply our models uh, and uh, use those data to estimate things like stock size, stock status, and assess the impacts of fisheries and other variables on the population dynamics. <laughs> and third and equally important is the step of communicating results. Uh, we have our, our science together and have to present those data and statistics and, and advise managers and stakeholders about sustainable levels of harvest. So with that context, I'll just sort of uh, jump through these, uh, these uh, big sections and talk about my experiences with each of these steps. And so the first step of collecting data, I've come to learn that it's useful to know things about sampling theory, gear technology, and fisheries, and probably many other things. Uh, and uh, I've come to learn that there are two core monitoring programs behind stock assessment. Uh, and again, a lot of you guys at Marine Institute are probably quite familiar with this, uh, but there are fisheries dependent data, and this is where catch monitoring comes in. Uh, and of course, uh, this is in the ideal world, uh, that part should be pretty easy and should be a simple tabulation of the fish subtracted from the the, the water uh, by uh, by fisheries. Um, but uh, but of course it's not always that easy and there's a lot behind uh, catch monitoring programs and there are challenges with partial sampling of different areas and preferential sampling, how to interpret catch per unit effort. Uh, and so there's lots of uh, details behind that. Uh, that so far I've uh, largely uh, avoided um, and instead uh, spent more of my time uh, learning the details behind fisheries independent data, uh, which are, are trawl surveys to a large degree is my experience with them uh, to collect basic information on population size. Uh, and of course, these are also fraught with challenges, um, but at least there's a, a solid basis in sampling theory. Uh, and so that that gives some grounds to work with and understand it. 
and uh, and and wrap your head around what the, what the values mean. Um, and one of my first big tasks as a postdoc with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, was to try and answer again a fairly straightforward question of are we sampling enough or too much in our multi-species survey conducted off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador? And uh, and my my mind eventually jumped to trying to simulate these data uh, because that is uh, creating your own world and your own data is an area where you can really scale, ramp up the sampling effort, ramp down the sampling effort, and then evaluate the consequences of that. And so I challenged myself to simulate some realistic survey data, uh, and I built a sim survey in the process. And that's an R package for uh, simulating virtual, a virtual population and the survey. And of course, I learned a heck of a lot on a lo along the way. Uh, the first lesson was that reality is quite complicated. Uh, and there's a lot of details behind fish population dynamics, uh, the way they, the behavioral uh, features of them and how they cluster in space and time. Um, and uh, and the, the survey itself is has some multi layers of complexity as well. Uh, so each of those layers had to be thought through carefully uh, because there are some important sampling features that emerge from uh, the properties of the underlying fish distribution. And one important feature that I've uh, come to learn that's important to consider and account for is the fact that we are often sampling clusters of fish. Uh, that have similar characteristics, such as length or age, uh, long been known at fish school. Uh, and, uh, and what this does is that it results in samples at specific location uh, with strong intra-hawk correlation. And so you might sample fish in one specific spot and catch a bunch of fish that are, are 10 centimeters, plus or minus 2 centimeters. Um, and so you could sample hundreds in that one spot but your effective sample size may simply be one or two. You may only need to, to sample that many to get a sense of the frequency distribution in that specific area. You need to expand and, and broaden your scope and your survey horizon to, uh, to get a better sense of what the distribution is of the total population. So that's, that's important to account for. And the other complexity is with the structure of the survey itself. Um, these surveys are the ones conducted off our coast are generally designed to sort of step one is take a bunch of sets of multiple locations, typically a stratified random survey. Um, and then once you have numbers and weights from the, those sets, those, uh, those fish uh, are subsampled for things like length determination. Uh, and then the length groupings are then further subsampled. Uh, for for other biological samples such as uh, age determination. So the the way to uh, try and deal with this was to break it down into bite sized pieces, take it step by step to build up a virtual survey. And uh, step one was to simulate a population, simulate abundance using a common cohort model. Um, and that's what's behind the code and uh, for for that step. Once you have the population, simulate spatial aggregation and spread that population throughout uh, a space uh, in a, in a semi-realistic way uh, using covariant structures. Um, with a population spread throughout space, uh, then you can conduct a virtual survey with stratified random sampling. And because of the underlying properties of the population, um, the uh, more or less realistic survey data are the end result there. So I'll just walk through a couple quick plots uh, demonstrating some of these simulation output. Um, first, the cohort equation in the sim abundance functions allows for a couple different life histories to be worked up fairly quickly. Uh, ones with A is a longer lived species and B is a shorter lived species with higher rates of mortality, but perhaps higher recruitment. Um, so there's, there's lots of power there to adjust the dynamics of the population. And then there's the ability to uh, adjust the spatial properties of the population and simulate a more clustered population. Maybe it's a schooling fish uh, that aggregate in very specific locations and tight locations. And so 
things like the decorrelation range can be adjusted down to 100 kilometers to make for really tight clusters. Uh, and in contrast, you can sp spread out the distribution as well uh, using this Gaussian simulation field uh, to, to create a population that's more diffuse and spread out throughout, uh, throughout space. And the, uh, the thing about the covariance structure that was built up uh, is that it imposes a, a correlation across space, uh, age, and year, such that uh, if you increase the correlation, uh, similar age fish tend to occur in similar places. And so you have a clustering of maybe older fish up here and younger fish down here. And so that, that introduces that size-specific schooling behavior uh, that is often observed in nature. What emerges from that when you apply a stratified random survey are, are sets with uh, some very big catches if it's a clustered population and lots of other areas with lots of zeros. Uh, and so this, uh, this is uh, some uh, properties that we often see with our actual survey data. Uh, and uh, the, the great thing about simulation world is that this is what our survey density might look like in reality, but we can ramp up our sampling effort and really collect a lot more fish and see what the benefits of extra effort put into a survey might look like, or, or the consequences in the, in the reverse of, of scaling back the effort. And again, the, uh, the emergent properties of the, with the underlying population is that the sampling in one quadrant might catch younger fish, uh, smaller smaller lengths and younger ages, whereas in another area, there might be a lot of more older fish hanging out. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is a, a feature, uh, that an abstraction, abstraction of what we see in nature to try and uh, uh, get at that clustered sampling nature of our data. So in the end, what we have is a a uh, simulation framework that is quite flexible for testing survey designs. Um, and we can assess the impacts of varying sampling protocol and compare the truth versus estimate. There's a bunch of different ways to go about estimating the population size. And for simplicity, I focused on design-based estimators rather than uh, uh, model-based estimators like uh, uh, species distribution models uh, to avoid having to specify distributions. There's simplicity in the design-based approach, uh, as you don't need to uh, assume the underlying distribution, and it provides an unbiased estimator of the true population available to the survey. Um, as a case study, uh, focused on uh, first on a virtual stratified random survey of a 3PS COD-inspired simulation, uh, use design-based stratified estimators and uh, varied set density, length, and age sampling effort, and to see what the impacts of those different toggles are to try and answer that question. The first result was just focus on the total abundance index, and uh, it was reassuring to see that the stratified estimators are indeed unbiased. And so the black line here represents the true underlying population available to survey, uh, and the probability envelopes here uh, indicate the spread of the estimated population size. And the other notable feature is that more sets are better, again, as predicted by sampling theory. Uh, if you have a lot of high set density, uh, your estimates are going to be a, a lot more reliable. These results were echoed uh, in the length stratified uh, estimates. Uh, and again, it was clear that more sets are better but not necessarily clear that uh, the increasing lens sampling effort in specific sites uh, was a huge uh, improvement. Um, and again, that's, uh, that's related to the effect of sample size. And so it's uh, equally efficient to, almost equally efficient to just collect 10 fish in each site, just sample a lot more sites. Now, all that made sense so far, um, but then I got to the age-based results uh, and much to my uh, confusion, they were biased. Uh, and I had no idea why uh, we were getting biased results and uh, the estimates coming from a stratified estimator were, uh, were overestimating or underestimating the true population size sometimes. And that is until I read uh, this paper, which uh, promoted the application of 
uh, uh, statistical estimators that uh, estimate uh, or, or collect otoliths uh, at each and every set. And so uh, what they promoted was the uh, sampling of ages at each site uh, to account for the cluster sampling nature of surveys. But what we do uh, in our surveys is, uh, is to sample so many ages throughout a whole division. And that means some sets may not have ages and otoliths sampled on them. And so that introduces bias at uh, uh, when the an age length key is applied. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a bit problematic. And so applying their alternate sampling design and their proposed alternate design-based analysis, um, we get uh, in simulation world a non-biased design-based result. So this exercise really helped me appreciate a couple of things. Uh, one, the elegance of design-based surveys and analyses. Uh, also, the importance of sampling at many locations as possible. These things are all were all known uh, long before I came around. Um, but it was also uh, an important lesson that simulations are useful for revealing unanticipated problems and for testing solutions to those problems uh, using alternate strategies. So, moving on to the next chunk, um, we have data, now what? Uh, you know, and these survey data are great for answering, helping answer the question of how many fish are in the sea, um, but how do we get at the question of how many can we sustainably harvest? And this is where stock assessment models come in and uh, another area where I get uh, confused a lot sometimes because there's a lot of details behind stock assessment modeling. And this is a realm where it's useful to know things about population ecology, statistics, programming, fisheries, and, and that's probably a short list. Um, and there are many different options for assessing a stock and many different models uh, from surplus production, delay difference, pop, virtual population analysis, uh, lots of different names, lots of different histories behind each of those options. Uh, and there's no equivalent to a generalized linear model, which was my comfort zone in the in my eco ecology training. So my uh, intro into that world was to uh, focus on a specific model called NCAM, as I was asked to update uh, NCAM, which is the Northern Cod assessment model uh, built by Noel Cadigan uh, at uh, the Marine Institute. Uh, and this is a very advanced state of the art state space integrated stock assessment model uh, built for northern cod that accounts for underreported catches and variable natural mortality rates. And what it means to update it is to just simply add new data uh, collected since the last assessment uh, and crank the wheel on the assessment. And that's that's a fairly straightforward uh, step, I suppose, but uh, I needed to understand the data processing. Uh, to feel good about it, and also try to understand the model as best I possibly could. Uh, so to aid me that in that exercise, I wrapped the code into an R package and built a dashboard uh, in the in the process. And again, I I learned a lot in the process um, uh, because uh, I needed a lot of visuals to help me out with it, and I needed to look at each and every uh, step of the data processing. Uh, so it was a, a useful exercise to go through. And uh, circling back, it was also uh, useful to look into more of the details on Northern Cod as well in the history, uh, but it's a stock that probably doesn't need much of an introduction uh, because it's uh, iconic, infamous, and, uh, and very data rich. Uh, but it's one of those cases that are pretty worldwide renowned for a uh, uh, collapsed stock that, uh, that uh, the finger was pointed largely to mismanagement uh, and because uh, there were a lot uh, supported a huge fishery and now there are not and they have been slow to recovery, recover. Um, as mentioned, it's very data rich uh, and NCAM is a, a wonderful creation in that it tries to integrate multiple sources of data from multiple monitoring programs um, from the reported landings uh, from catch at age information, uh, reported landings by month are utilized, the offshore RV survey uh, indices are utilized. These are the design-based indices that I mentioned earlier. 
Um, there are an inshore, there's an inshore sentinel survey that is led by the harvesters uh, that are integrated into the model as well. Those, uh, those are uh, extra data set to go in. Uh, there's information from Smith Sound that's included. Uh, and finally, to top it all off, a huge tagging uh, data set uh, is uh, included in the model to help with estimates of mortality rates. So, um, I, uh, I don't have a, enough time to, to go into all the details of all the equations uh, that are behind the, how each of these data sets are used, uh, but I'll just cover some of the general concepts. And the, in, at its core, really what NCAMS tries to do is estimate things like the population size and vital rates. Uh, the F is the fishing mortality, M is the natural mortality rate. Uh, and what it does, these are unobserved processes that are estimated internally uh, and that are indirectly observed and inferred from the observations from the various monitoring program inputs that are included. Uh, in general, N is uh, thought to be informed by reported landings and survey indices. That's, uh, those are two variables, uh, inputs that help with uh, landing on the magnitude of the stock that is in the water. One of the challenges, two of the challenges associated with this is bounds. Uh, these are reported landings, but how much higher are they uh, actually? Uh, how many more uh, cod are taken out of the water than are actually reported? And that's where the uh, sensor bounds come in that, uh, that were built in. And there's also catchability to consider for the survey indices, as not all age groups are captured equally well in the survey. Um, the vital rates of F and M are informed by the catch composition, survey indices, uh, core tracking in the survey indices, as well as tagging data. A couple of challenges again, catchability is a challenge as uh, it's uh, it's confounded with the rates of mortality. Uh, there's also reporting rate to consider how many of those tag fish that are caught by harvesters again are actually reported back to uh, fisheries and oceans. And there's also incomplete mixing to consider. Uh, but the, the idea is that uh, to utilize all these data and there are sure there are some compounds if one data set were used in particular, but using them all together can, can minimize the uh, uh, confounding and, uh, and aid a sort of statistical triangulation to uh, infer what's actually happening with the underlying population process. And also by assuming the same underlying population process, if we observe conflicting trends uh, in our various survey indices, then that means that something is, uh, is that indicates that something is misspecified and that we need to uh, tell the model or uh, rethink how, how we in, interpret um, some of the survey indices that are put in and tell the model about it. So, to have a quick look here now at the dashboard, um, this is what, uh, what I found really useful to walk through just to get some quick visuals on the stock um, and the stock assessment model and how it's fitting to each data input that's put in. Uh, we, can, we can go in and look at drop down menus, look at the landings, uh, see the details of behind that, how, how the predicted landings are falling in, whether or not they're falling inside the uh, censored bounds, and so this uh, this is a good diagnostic of the the model, um, and we can also jump to things like the RV survey index and have a look at the the residuals and the observed versus fitted values, uh, and to see whether the uh, the assumptions we're including in the model are reasonable or not. Um, and one thing that that has been jumping out in the past few years is uh, estimation problems with the RV survey index uh, for, for recent cohorts. And so it's underestimating uh, some of the recent cohorts here uh, in recent years. And so that's a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, and what's curious about it is that if we jump over to the Sentinel survey index, uh, we see a bit of the opposite pattern. And, uh, and what this means is that it's overestimating some of the recent cohorts. And so, one survey index is indicating one pattern and the other is indicating uh, another. And so they're pulling apart uh, each other and conflicting. And so uh, it indicates that we need to uh, go in and adjust some of the assumptions made in a model 
uh, and perhaps consider uh, changing the uh, our assumptions about what portion of the stock is available to the Sentinel, the smaller scale inshore Sentinel survey, maybe. And so those uh, it spurs uh, it's a diagnostic that spurs some further exploration. Uh, speaking of exploration, another thing that uh, jumped out to me uh, quite a bit when digging into this, uh, and I was quite curious about uh, the estimates of the rates of natural mortality. Um, in the 1980s, it was relatively low. And then when the 19, early 1990s struck, uh, there was a huge spike estimated in the model in the rates of natural mortality and subsequent to which corresponded to the collapse. And subsequent to that, there's been a couple of ups and downs in the rates of natural mortality estimated. And uh, in recent years, uh, the rates of fishing mortality are relatively quite low compared to rates of natural mortality. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a pretty important driver of the stock uh, and uh, factor that's impeding uh, its, its slow recovery. So that's a, that's a bit of a curiosity. So a couple lessons learned from NCAM. Uh, and the exercise of trying to wrap my head around it. It, uh, it definitely helped me appreciate all the careful and brilliant thought and work that went into uh, building NCAM. It is uh, quite the advanced model with a lot of careful things carefully considered and, and accounted for. Um, it also revealed a, a conflict between uh, the RV and Sentinel survey indices that, uh, that requires some further thought. Um, and finally, uh, the most pressing, pressing thing, at least in my mind, that, that awoke the ecological detective in me uh, was the patterns in the rates of natural mortality, um, because it kept on wondering what is the cause. And NCAM uh, a little bit left me wondering because um, the natural deaths are inferred in this model. Uh, it, uh, the causes, specific causes are unknown. It describes the pattern using all the data that's fit into it. Uh, and, and, and produces some reliable estimates. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, the openness of what the underlying uh, cause and, and what's causing that it le leads to many hypotheses about what might be going on. One of the thoughts is on reported catch. Another is predation from uh, things like seals. Uh, and finally, there's also the prey limitation consideration. Uh, the item that I decided to focus my energy on was prey limitation, given uh, previous research that's been uh, published on uh, the importance of capelin and shrimp, uh, or uh, mo mostly capelin, on, uh, on cod and their growth. Um, both of these prey items are important uh, in their diet, and, uh, and the thought is that limited access might slow their growth and impede their recovery. Um, and the thing about it too is that resource limitation can also increase, uh, lead to increased starvation rates. And so it had me wondering, could starvation be a significant driver of northern cod mortality? Um, to start looking into this, uh, looked at the uh, looked at the individual data first, uh, because prey limitation is experienced by individuals. Uh, and uh, and competition among individuals, and so we we expect individuals to die off when body condition falls below a critical threshold. Uh, they can only maintain so much energy loss before they so succumb to starvation. Um, and if they're not getting enough energy in to maintain their body condition, uh, then then ultimately they, they may die. And so. Uh, some previous research uh, indicated that it, laboratory work showed that this is actually true. This happens, uh, and and uh, proposed a, a sort of condition threshold to which this might happen. Another study applied that condition threshold to uh, estimate uh, rates of natural mortality, uh, and just by looking at the proportion of cod in poor condition, as this might indicate, uh, be an indicator of trends in natural mortality. Um, the great thing about focusing in on body condition is that um, an index trying to index starvation mortality is that uh, these data are commonly available. Uh, we have access to more than 100,000 samples from northern cod throughout the time series um, that ha uh, with lengths and weights information. There's the DFO-led uh, spring 3L survey 
and fall 2J3KL surveys. Uh, there's also the CIFAR led RV acoustic trawl survey conducted through the region. And finally, a harvester led sentinel survey that is in the inshore in the summer. So we have lots of information throughout the year uh, and uh, we can get some uh, really solid time series information on body condition from length and gutted weight measurements. Now, these data need to be interpreted with care um, because there's a couple important things to consider uh, with regards to uh, factors that may affect their body condition throughout a year. Uh, one is seasonal effects. Um, some seasons might be harsher than others, and we know from lots of observation that cod tend to be in really po relatively poor condition in the spring. Uh, there's also age effects to consider as the uh, Big fish eats the little fish, and so older. What that means is older cod tend to eat uh, more capelin than younger uh, cod, uh, and so they have a bit more of a piscivorous diet. And so the proportion of cod in poor condition may vary by season and age groups because of the differential effects of uh, those uh, prey availability and uh, season. So uh, with that in mind. Uh, developed a model that attempts to uh, capture seasonal and age effects with an underlying process that assumes that uh, mean condition is a function of the previous month's condition as well as the uh, same month in the previous year, uh, and finally a harmonic component to uh, capture a consistent seasonal pattern. And finally, noise that's correlated across age groups because similar ages might experience similar uh, patterns and condition. Um, when it comes to explaining the observations, uh, they're thought they were assumed to be a function of this underlying mean condition, as well as a random effect of set uh, and time varying noise as, uh, as some uh, years, the observations were a lot more uh, spread out than other years. Um, similar to that previous work I mentioned, Cassini et al., uh, we assume that fish in poor condition die, and so if we see so many of the calculate a proportion of uh, cod in poor condition and assume that they have about a month to live uh, below a certain threshold. And from that, we derive a starvation induced mortality in X. Um, looking now at the uh, uh, fitted versus observed values, uh, we see in the two to four age group, and there's, uh, we estimated for five and seven age group and an eight plus age group, uh, what jumps out in the whole time series, there's lots of ups and downs throughout the year. Uh, overall, things are fairly stable, um, but uh, some obvious seasonal effects. And, uh, and what's important to look out for is, is dips down under this orange line, which is our assumed critical threshold. Um, and so the proportion of the cod that fall below this critical line are thought to um, succumb to, to starvation. So that's where the index uh, comes from. Um, looking at that another clear way, um, this is just uh, the trend in the in starvation induced mortality index, uh, and we should indeed just focus on the trend here. Uh, it's relatively flat for the youngest age group. Um, for the older age groups, it becomes a bit more dynamic uh, with a noticeable spike in the early 1990s. Uh, with a li little bit of ups and downs uh, in the subsequent uh, post collapse years. And same goes for the oldest uh, eight plus age group with maybe a bit more of a pronounced uh, increase, uh, uh, apparent increase in the starvation mortality index uh, in the early 1990s. So, as a result, certainly indicate that uh, starvation mortality rates are dynamic. Uh, but what's left uh, questionable because of the sensitivity up to, uh, to a variable is the magnitude. Um, the, the, the magnitude of the index is quite sensitive to the threshold that we assumed a portion of the cod below a certain value. So if we increase that, then that changes the, the index quite dramatically. Um, and so, uh, it still begs the question of, are the trends meaningful? And there's uh, a couple of ways to look at that. And, uh, one is to try and compare the trends to independent estimates of natural mortality. And we, what we did there was uh, uh, looked at the rates of natural mortality estimated by NCAM and compared those to the starvation-induced mortality index. 
Uh, and on the flip side, we can look at, okay, do the changes in their body condition correspond to some sort of environmental process, specifically prey availability? And for that, we compared uh, the changes in uh, body condition or that's seen through the starvation induced mortality index to trends of relative biomass of capelin and shrimp, thinking that if there's relatively few capelin or shrimp, then that's uh, years where you might see heightened rates of uh, starvation induced mortality. Comparing uh, the results from NCAM to the uh, starvation analysis, uh, we see positive associations between the two. Uh, and the, the association is strongest for the older age groups. And so when we, when we observe uh, more and more fish in poor condition, that's when that, those years align with years when rates of natural mortality from NCAM are heightened. Looking at the relationship with shrimp, uh, the relative abundance of shrimp, um, we see that when there are uh, uh, relatively shrimp are relatively abundant, uh, the starvation induced mortality rates of uh, of cod are are low, particularly for the youngest age groups. Less so for the middle age group, and uh, and the relationship breaks down for the oldest age group. Uh, when it comes to cod, or and capelin. Uh, we see the opposite pattern with the uh, middle and older age groups uh, showing a stronger negative association with the relative abundance of capelin. Looking at it just in a pure time series uh, perspective, uh, you can see that there's some parallel patterns in the, uh, in the uh, trends estimated from NCAM uh, as, and the ones independently estimated using this uh, starvation analysis. So, interpreting this and going back to our ecological detective work and thinking about the case of northern cod, uh, what happened? Why aren't they coming back? Well, uh, these uh, these results and this triangulation effort certainly indicate that starvation was a, a key factor uh, contributing to their demise and slow recovery. Uh, it also highlights the practical relevance of considering uh, changes in body condition. Uh, as well as changes in prey availability and the impact that that may have on a predator. Now, it's important to keep in mind as well, it was quite clear that the impacts are not equal across season. Um, and what was notable here is that spring appears to be uh, uh, the, the season when the cod dip to their lowest condition. Um, and, and it could, in fact, indeed be a, a bit of an energetic bottleneck or after coming through uh, maybe a harsh winter and declining uh, condition uh, leading into a spawning period. And so that's a point at which mature cod have to train off, trade off reproduction, growth, and survival. And, uh, and therefore the risk may be relatively greater uh, for mature cod than, uh, than for juvenile cod who don't have to make that trade off. Um, the impacts were also not equal across the age group. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there was a stronger association between shrimp and the younger age group. And, uh, and this makes sense in the context of the diets. Uh, those younger fish tend to eat uh, more shrimp than the older cod, uh, which tend to have a bit more of a piscivorous uh, capelin dominated diet. And what this means is that uh, we need to keep in mind the prey, relative prey availability for the different age groups and what that might mean for their overall population dynamics. And indeed, the, the collapse of Capelin in the early 1990s uh, may have left a hole in the prey field for cod, uh, particularly that older, maturing Komodo population, which is pretty critical to uh, helping a population grow. So, but, you know, looking, thinking a bit beyond cod, uh, the regime shift of the 1990s uh, affected more than just cod. Uh, there was a decline in commercial and non-commercial species. Uh, capelin have yet to recover, and older cod uh, since then have had to rely on suboptimal shrimp. Um, and the concerning thing as well is that shrimp are currently not doing so great. Uh, and so with without a robust prey base, cod are unlikely to recover. Uh, they simply need food to grow, um, and so that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind for the outlook of cod into the future. Thinking uh, beyond cod, um, the basic idea is broadly applicable. 
um, and uh, just by looking from the basic uh, from prey availability to its effect on body condition to inferring starvation mortality. And these are common data and it's a flexible model. And so there is room for applying it to other uh, other stocks to see if there's any uh, promising relationships there. And finally, um, these sort of mechanistic considerations are, are useful as we try to progress towards ecosystem based fisheries management. Um, the final thought on lessons learned here in this exercise uh, was that there's a, it was reassuring that, uh, okay, there's. There seems to be lots of room for applied ecology and stock assessment. Now, um, jumping on to the uh, last uh, core concept to consider and core step to consider, and that's about communicating results. So, we've done our science, and uh, and then the the final step is uh, to tell our peers and and the managers about it. And in this step is useful to know things about data visualization, as well as scholarly and science communication. Um, and in this realm, uh, my third big task was to uh, was to try and present results from NCAM at an update ass uh, at an update assessment uh, for Northern COD. And what this means is that uh, that I had to try and communicate results. Uh, of the update to fellow scientists, managers, stakeholders uh, at an assessment meeting to, and this is very applied science, this is to try and advise on, uh, help advise on uh, sustainable uh, catches of, of COD into the future. Um, and the uh, thing about the group is that it's a very diverse group with varying degrees of experience with, uh, with stock assessment. Uh, it's not exactly the same experience as presenting at a conference or, or putting a paper forward to a scientific journal. Um, so needed to think, collect, uh, think uh, carefully about how to present this information um, because our collective goal is to vet the results um, and, and ask the question of, is the model making sense of the data? And my basic idea was that, well, I put together the interactive dashboard to help me understand the model. Uh, perhaps it might be useful to others as well. And, uh, and so I forged ahead and, uh, and presented the interactive dashboard uh, being a bit unconventional, um, but, uh, but it turned out to be a useful exercise as I could jump through things in a, in a very nonlinear fashion to display uh, multiple diagnostics of the stock and how the different data sets are interacting and how the uh, how the uh, how things are playing out and uh, how uh, you know retrospective patterns are looking and finally to include uh, with uh, with catch multiplier scenarios to uh, this is the the end sort of uh, advice that comes out from the northern cod assessment model here's the outlook of cod into the future if we apply this catch multiplier or, or this much catch um, and to get at that sort of final question of how many can we take out of the water without damaging sort of do no harm right and so uh, lots of just providing information to managers and risk tables uh, to uh, to for them to do their risk-based management right uh, on the stock and so um, i won't dwell on the, that because uh, I'm getting short on time here, I see. Uh, just go through the lessons learned about this. Uh, first thing I found that was exciting was that uh, my peers noticed patterns that I overlooked. And so this led to really engaging discussions around the model uh, and helped me further understand things. Um, and in the meeting, it, it had aided a more fulsome review, I think, of a very complex model as, as individuals could also uh, access the dashboard and have their own individual explorations of it. Uh, and I, I hope it helped uh, stakeholders and managers gain a deeper understanding of the uncertainties around the model and how uh, estimates of things like uh, the process error variance have a consequence on the, uh, the, the patterns and the probabilities and presented in the risk tables. So, uh, to wrap up real quick here, I'll uh, just revisit my statement earlier that stock assessment is hard. 
Uh, and perhaps a more positive way to think about that is uh, is that stock assessment is interdisciplinary. Um, it uh, it samples concepts from the various fields, from sampling theory, gear technology, fishers management, computer programming, statistics, population ecology, data visualizations, uh, science communication, and this is a this is a very incomplete list. And so no one person can be an expert in all of those fields. And, and that's why it's, it's very useful to uh, take a collaborative approach. Uh, and I know myself, I'm quite thankful for uh, lots of people that I've collaborated with um, and uh, learned a heck of a lot from. And just, I've listed a few here. Again, it's a very incomplete list. Um, but with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and uh, take any questions if there's time. Thank you, Thank very you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you very much for that. That was very informative. Um, does anyone in this room have um, questions for Paul? No. All right. Anyone in the chat? Nope. Well, I'll ask some questions then. Um, for your sim the simulated population model, you showed uh, a spatial distribution of the simulated population. Uh, and I had questions. So does that, is that based off of just relational distance from where the fish aggregate or do you take into account some of the physical environmental data when that's created? Right, and uh, one of the uh, one of the variables I forgot to mention or failed to mention that uh, that was included in the uh, as a covariate in the simulation of their distribution was depth, uh, and so a, a a depth environmental association uh, relationship was is imposed uh, in these uh, in these uh, simulations, and so um, the I think this fish uh, might just prefer to be in sort of Hundred meters of water, um, and uh, and just not occur in uh, in much deeper waters like five hundred meters, and so that's one layer of environmental association that's been included, uh, and uh, but it, it would be good to uh, again add more layers of realism to the simulation, and add the possibility to include things like temperature and environmental associations with uh, with temperature to again build up a more uh, a more realistic species distribution. Uh, without having to lean so so heavily on a Gaussian random field. Cool. Thank you. Um, also, how do stakeholders react to this presentation of very complicated math and um, so ideas that are not common knowledge? Or is there the end? Your end explanation makes sense. Starving fish don't do well and de are dependent on their prey but um how does how has the stakeholders reaction to your explanations been um i think uh i think it helps that uh a lot of the uh, the patterns uh that that were presented and talked about are, are very much aligned with what they observe on the water as well uh like uh fish in very poor condition in the spring uh, but in much better condition in the fall. And so those are matters that they can relate to as well as uh, the concern about the low availability of capelin uh, is shared by a lot of harvesters on the water as well. Um, but also the, uh, uh, the, the reaction is often uh, as well that there's always more work to do and, and the question of the seals and the impacts of seal predation always comes up uh, and is uh, another area that requires uh, a bit more work. Some of the work that's out there already is indicating that they're not a major driver of the population. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's still a, that's still a, a predator prey top down influence question uh, that uh, that repeatedly comes up and it would be good to do a bit more research on that one too. Thank you very much. Those were my questions. Oh, we've got one more. Uh, 
Uh, not coming through on my end. Yeah, yeah. It's based, it's based on, on my computer speaker. So yeah, I'll come up here. Hey, Paul, I'm really speaking. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You're, you're coming through with me. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Good. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, I have a question. So, so you're, you're an ecologist by training. No, you do more, you know, stock assessment. One thing we do fairly well, I think, at universities to train ecologists. You know, we, we produce a lot of ecologists in our different programs, whether biology, CAB, OSC, or MI. One thing we try to produce is stock assessment scientists of students, but it's very challenging to, to do it because stock assessment is hard, but also it's very challenging to do because they, there does not seem to be a massive interest from students to do stock assessment. You know, it, I think it's more attractive to go on a big ship in the Arctic than being in a computer doing quantitative stuff. And when you do quantitative, you want to be in finance or insurance, you don't necessarily want to be in fishery. So how can we, you know, make maybe stock assessment a bit more attractive coming from your perspective at DFO? I, it's, it's a complicated question, but I, I'll be happy to hear your input on that. And, and that's uh, that's a very good question, and, uh, and I guess it's like at its core is like how do we make stock assessment more sexy, and and that's really it's it's a real challenge, and uh, and and I think that stock assessment is good for someone who uh, enjoys the challenge and enjoys interdisciplinary work, um, and I don't know how um, how we attract more people to. Um, sit down on a computer and uh, and do uh, more codey, statsy uh, sort of work. Uh, personally, I, I find it uh, a really rewarding task, um, more rewarding than I ever anticipated I would. Uh, the the coding aspects of things and the, uh, the 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 statistics is something that I've latched onto more than I anticipated entering into ecology. And so I, I think uh, I've tried to make things uh, fun for myself by uh, fiddling with things like interact interactive graphics uh, and uh, and making things look cool. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if that's an answer to uh, to a question. I think it uh, it's all a matter of uh, personal preference and someone l landing in uh, the right place at the right time to see that there is appeal to uh, stock assessment as you can use your own um, sort of background and apply it to stock assessment since um, it's such a diverse topic. Um, so, you know, I found that I can use some of the ecology that I learned uh, to apply it to stock assessment and to forge it. But, you know, there's a, there's a use for people that have a very, very mathy brain, stassy brain uh, to, uh, to forge ahead with things and improve things as well. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a field that has the potential to a, attract a diverse group of people. Um, but how you attract people to it, um, that is a question that I think we probably need to figure out better how to make that happen. Yeah, just for me. yeah I think the point of. Of it to be much more interdisciplinary than what what we think, you know, and trying to get that message across. And I, I guess you know the fact that your example of integrating applied ecology into stock assessment, I think this is a type of example that can really, you know, uh, I don't know, talk to talk to some students that are more into the ecology side, for example, and the, the application, the applied part of it can be can be a good message to get across a bit more. I think in the, the interdisciplinary aspect as well. Anyway, thanks uh, thanks for the talk. Paul. Thank you. One more question. All right. Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. Oh, there we go. All right. Hey, uh, hey Paul. This is uh, Colin Frank. I was the seminar coordinator last year. Anyway, I don't know if you went to any of those. Um, but I was curious if uh, you had thought about applying 
the uh, your simulation to to a population of fish that you know to be exact. I know you were you were simulating an exact population, but if you did it in the real world with an exact population, like if you did it in um, like a lake, like a stocked lake or something like that, I'm thinking because I've I've seen population stock assess or stock assessments in like um, Florida lakes, and they can be very exact. And I, I was wondering if you could put your simulation up against like something like that and uh, compare the two, and uh, yeah, just to see how it see how it holds up with something like that. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, and uh, and I, I would like to uh, maybe I should uh, maybe look into more of those very exact stock assessments uh, a bit more because it's not by uh, things that are a bit more fuzzy has been what. My experience has been, um, and so um, those sorts of data could be quite useful for uh, conditioning the parameters behind the the, uh, the simulation model here. Um, and so, one of the one of the big challenges with uh, with building a simulation is coming up with parameters that are that sort of emulate reality uh, closely, and uh, and with such noisy data to work with. Uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes a challenge to uh, to replicate the results in simulation, uh, and so um, lake data uh, that probably have a higher set density, uh, more restricted spatial area, um, that would be a neat case study to dig into uh, and to see uh, what what those results look like and how they compare to. Uh, something more oceanic, uh, uh, more oceanic and open survey. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see there's a question in the chat. Uh, if you have time to answer one more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the question is, um, what would be the most prominent parameters to incorporate into starvation mortality indices in the survey area, like nutrients, temperature, or harvest? Um, I guess the when it comes to starvation-induced mortality, my brain automatically jumps to uh, nutrients um, and and the energy that the predator managed to manages to pump into its system uh, to maintain its body condition or or gain uh, body condition and pump on fat and reserves and so that's where that's the uh, first sort of covariate that I jump to when trying to explain um, changes in uh, starvation based mortality or body condition um, but there are other uh, there are other matters to consider as well in the uh, Baltic Sea, I believe, uh, or, or the Cassini studies, uh, uh, follow up studies that they've done have focus on dissolved oxygen as uh, an explanatory variable for changes in body condition for cod there, um, because uh, because that has declined in recent years and and it looks to be an important variable for explaining the patterns uh, in their body condition. And uh, likewise, temperature could affect uh, their ability to, uh, you know, maintain their body condition as well. So those are those are uh, two important things to uh, to look at as well. Um, and finally, uh, another thing that's been suggested to look at is uh, parasite load, um, because if you have a parasite on you sucking energy out of your system, that's obviously going to affect your body condition as well. Um, so those are those are uh, uh, a couple of different thoughts on uh, explaining uh, the uh, the changes in body condition. Happy to expand expand if I didn't uh, really uh, answer your question properly. Great, thank you so much for that. Sorry for keeping you late. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, for our first seminar. Uh, our next one will be October 21st, where we're gonna be hearing from Ben Grady about halibut aquaculture. 
So I will see everyone there in two weeks, Friday at 1.30. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.